45 men and women pursue an extraordinary dream. 22 countries, 19 months, a voyage around the world. Tall Ship Chronicles. Finally. The tall ship Picton Castle has only had five landfalls in its first hundred days at sea. Now, that lifestyle is about to change. Tahiti. Tahiti is the gateway to hundreds of fantasy islands. And that's not all. There's great surf, great food, great views, better views. This place is the antithesis of ship life, so much so that it's broken the resolve of sailors for centuries. It was here, for example, that the men who eventually mutinied on the bounty first realized they didn't want to go back to England. And who could blame them? <laughs> Tahiti is full of unique cultural oddities, like the whole idea of etching your lineage and life story permanently onto your skin. This is where tattooing began. And while at first glance they may appear to be nothing more than body art, the reality is that Polynesian tattoos are a declaration of self. You know, half the crew is gonna be tattooed by the time we're leaving Tahiti for Morea. I mean, that's just in a couple days. And already today there are five or six people getting tattoos. Um, a sailor thing. We're all sailors. What's better than a tattoo for a souvenir, you know? You next, Wendy? No way. Does <laughs> it hurt a lot? Of course it hurts a lot. It's a needle jabbing through your skin 43 times a second. It hurts just to watch. Back in Lunenburg, tattoos were a topic we talked endlessly about. In those days, Tom said he was definitely going to get one. Personally, I thought he'd be more likely to quit the trip than to voluntarily endure some painful scarring. Shows what I know. Everybody's pretty surprised to hear you're getting a tattoo. Because I don't think a lot of the crew thinks of me as a sailor. I don't know. It's, uh... I am now, though. You know, you're, the more you do this, the less your employment options become. Now you never can work at Disneyland again. Man. No, you know, that's true. <laughs> this is commitment. They say guys don't know about commitment. They do. That's commitment. Yeah, Good. And this is insanity. Body piercing. He has little bolts. Take a look. Maybe, yeah. maybe you like it. No, I'm wearing duct tape right now. <laughs> no access nipples. No access nipples. It's a strange world we live in. And it's an even stranger souvenir that Lauren is getting. No sudden movements. I'm going to read the instructions for Okay. Ow! Squeeze. Fuck. Squeeze. Fuck. It's all right, dude. <laughs> My, my She's taking it well. If I had a ring rammed through my nipple, does it bleed still? No, oh no, is it? It's healed. Like I would leap up and start dancing around like some sort of crazed goof. Speaking of which, as you watch this, please remember one important fact: alcohol is involved. But not for Liz. For her, there's real passion involved. Liz has never been to Polynesia, but for years now, she has been taking Polynesian dance classes. This is a big night for her. Okay, we select her for the next show with the Hidi. She stay with us. She's the best dancer. Okay, for the rest of you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Where do you learn? Florida? Oh, really? Ah, that's why we understand now. She learned to Florida. There's just something about Polynesian culture I love. They love life, you know, they love living. And I think that shows in all their music and dance.
This port isn't all song and dance, though. There's some nasty politics going down on board the ship. Jorge, our doctor, has just left the voyage after an ugly power struggle with Billy, the first mate. Uh, I could not be part of this great dream. I couldn't buy the ideology, and I could not uh, bend down and submit uh, to the leader. You gotta get the black uniforms out and start wearing them. It has been outed that we are a fascist organization. Sarcastic? What kind of truth? There's no room for personal opinions here. All fascist organizations have very complicated bureaucracies and hierarchies. You know all about that, so we gotta tighten up there, guys. The situation, though, is no joke. Some on board are saying that Jorge had to be squeezed off the ship because his laziness was becoming too infectious. Others think Jorge was bullied off the ship simply because he was an older man. And at least one person is worried that it might happen again. Sure it could happen again. It could happen to me. I think about that a lot. In Jorge's mind, he could not have stayed. That's the way he felt. And, uh, you know, it's too bad because he was my friend and he was also our doctor. And now we, we, we will be traveling without one. And, uh, and things happen on the ship. People get hurt pretty routinely. I just want to go over this with you guys really quickly. This is only to be grabbed in emergencies. If you have a cut and you need gauze, don't go in here. Jill has been thrust um, into the position of makeshift doctor. She's been picked because as a trained emergency medical technician, she's the most qualified person we've got. You know, the stuff that, that I worry about is stuff that you really can't control. It's, somebody waking me up in the middle of the night saying somebody's fallen and broken something, or who knows what. Uh, so I mean, it definitely crosses my mind a lot. If somebody in this situation with no doctor now, if somebody falls down and snaps a leg, right. what happens in terms of you know heavy duty painkillers? We do have the ability to give that stuff. You got your license to like mark out a shot of Demerol and off it goes? What no, happens? We have, uh, we have a service that is out of, I believe, Oregon. Uh, if a situation arises where we need to give out medication that is usually only prescribed by a doctor, we contact them by satellite phone and say, here's the situation, here's the problem, what can we give, how much do we give? And so we're actually giving medication under their authority. I wonder if that virtual doctor could tell us anything about the tropical disease we're bearing down on. So far, all we know about it is... I don't want it, and I don't want anybody else coming back on board and giving it to me. Thank you very much. For the first time since leaving Lunenburg, the ship has fresh crew. Newbies, in it for the short haul. Look at them. No tar stains, no black fingernails, no idea of what they're getting into. You guys mentally prepared for this task here? <laughs> oh, a bad thing is You'll about learn to happen. Fast. A very bad thing is about to happen. Don't go out fast. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm pace sorry. I'm yourself. Sorry, I'm sorry, yeah, pace I'm yourself. It's not a sprint. We're hauling in the anchor. Each of those chain links weighs 20 pounds, and the anchor they're attached to weighs 2,500 pounds. What do you think, Ed? I think he'd like a warning not to lock his elbow. Ooh! Heather, from Salem, Massachusetts, on the other hand, would simply like her money back. But that doesn't happen on the Picton Castle. You buy your ticket, you take your ride. So she swallows back her rising bile and settles into the realization that this 19th century styled ship is not quite as romantic as the brochure makes it out to be. In reality, this ship is old fashioned work. <laughs> Just sit down, sit down, put your hands on your knees. If she does throw up from exertion here, Heather can take comfort in the knowledge that every single one of us has already done the exact same thing. We're about to start six months of island hopping. Sailing to the island of Morea, Heather doesn't give up. She answers every order she hears. Oh, yeah. I think the hardest part is hearing what they say. Right. Sometimes yeah. people are so far away, yeah. it's like... Right. Yeah. The wind is strong and the sea is loud. For us, sailing the ship is becoming instinctual. For a newbie, though, good communication is crucial. The captain's usually calling the main and the mate's usually calling the four. And Julie is sort of running back and forth trying to relay both of those commands. But you're right, it's difficult to know what command is for you. Um, 
and but you know that if you can't hear, yell at the top of your lungs, say again or repeat. And that's another reason why all the orders should be repeated so that when a command is given and the whole crew repeats it, you hear it if you didn't hear it first. Or call them or something. Say again. Yeah, I am. But if you're not confused, it means you're not a real crew member. So if you're confused, then welcome aboard. We arrive at dusk, hoist the anchor light, and pray the mosquitoes are scarce. There's a disease here called dengue fever, a hideous ordeal transmitted by mosquitoes. The captain had dengue on his first world voyage, and his descriptions of the immobilizing hot flashes and pounding head and bulging eyes made most of us go, I don't care, I'm in paradise, and I am invincible. But now, we're getting news of a full-blown epidemic in Bora Bora, just 55 miles away. We need to pick up Smack. Smack is our nickname for Mac. He's off getting his French pilot's license, and Bora Bora is where we pick him up. I just think it's a dumb idea to go if, if, if there's a possibility of getting dengue fever. Like, I don't want it, and I don't want anybody else coming back on board and giving it to me. Like, it's no, no, it's not contagious, it's viral. It's a mosquito. I just, I just think it's a fit. dumb idea. But it won't kill you. Some of it, it can, if you get it twice. We read in the, in that Merck manual, the medical text, so it's just like, kind of nasty and it sucks a lot and it lasts for like three or four days, but if you're under one, it probably won't kill you. No, if you're under one, it will kill you. They get, yeah, old people and young one, people go. No, if you're under one, it will kill you. If you're yeah, older yeah, yeah. than one, it won't kill it you. Won't kill you. Yeah, you're While we're concerned about our health, <laughs> Heather is concerned about her investment. I feel like if I went home now, I wouldn't really know much about sales or anything. But I'm paying a third of my yearly salary to be here. So I expect to get a lot out of that. On this installment of Why Men Should Never Wear Skirts, we'll meet Derek's lily white butt ugly ass as he dangles high from the royal. Oh my God. It was all right until I got up top on the yard and I got an updraft. I felt great, but I gave a view, I think. I think, yeah. <laughs> Kept getting that question. What are you, are you wearing underwear? Have I worn underwear on this trip yet? Nobody who is on deck is giving you the, or is, yeah. I wonder is Derek wearing underwear question. <laughs> <laughs> Cheap, tawdry, uh, uh, Riviera, what's a Geraldo? Oh, uh, go away, you're just trying to buy into the up the skirt shot yourself now. <laughs> what a pack of weirdos. <laughs> This island, like almost everyone we'll visit, is ringed by a colossal reef. The captain has to make sure his chart work and navigational plans are flawless if he wants to get us out of here in one piece. And it's especially important today, because we're attempting a tricky maneuver called sailing off the hook. We set a few sails while the anchor is still out, and as the ship turns and slowly starts to go, we hoist the anchor and then set more sail. At least that's the plan. Uh, uh, anchor's at the water. I'll leave it there till we get underway. Very well. Bars out. Set up her topsails. Let go of the gear. Oh, Hoist away. Lee brace off. Wiggle, yeah. Let go of the gear. Please let go of the goddamn gear. Dan, let go of the gear. You got to throw out the gear. I can't set a fucking sail. OK, we get some, let's go Jesus. get going on setting right. sail here. And maybe that's a part of the learning process, having the people in charge yell at us, but I think that that doesn't, you know, so, someone said to me the other day that it doesn't make us work harder or quicker. It just, it scares us. And I'm afraid he's gonna want to make me <laughs> realize that he knows what he's doing and I don't. And I don't want to feel like a little piece of shit. <laughs> So, and he's, he hasn't done that, but I'm, that's, I guess that's why I avoid him, because I have a feeling that that might happen, I don't know. There you go. I don't like going lost. Sort of each other. I don't like it. I thought I would really like it, but I don't. Here, try moving down one more time. And I wish I did. <laughs> I don't think I've really that's done much idea. constructive like, sailing and stuff. You're gonna wanna... Okay, let me get out of your way. <laughs> okay, now you're just going to... Put all, yep, move your hand down as much as you can to where you feel comfortable and you're gonna move your next foot over. That's it. I don't feel like I can do it. No? Can you're I grab lean. this? You can, yep. 
There you go. Excellent. Now move yourself down a little more. So you're, watch the buns behind you. And just lean right over the air. Excellent. How you feel? Okay. Yeah? Keep moving out until you, it's a little tricky on this foot because see your feet are hitting the other yard. It's basically like following people around who, who already know what they're doing and just watching them. And that's a good way to learn, I guess. But I also think that having an organized program of training is beneficial. And I'm paying a third of my yearly salary to be here. So I expect to get a lot out of that. On the vest and the bow. Okay, on the stern. Come ahead on the stern. To say that there is no training or inadequate training on board is kind of ridiculous to me. The training we get on this ship doesn't come in neatly packaged little classroom settings where nautical mysteries are made obvious. Instead, our training comes on the job every day. Training here is as constant as life itself. I like to think of it as karate kid training. Remember in that movie how the lead character didn't even realize Mr. Miyagi was training him at the beginning? That's what it's like here. We train by osmosis, all day, every day. The only way you could be in this situation and not be absorbing information is if you were in a coma. The primary training really is the ship and the voyage itself, and standing the watch and learning how to steer and, and all the stuff that we do on watch going aloft. That's the sail training. Uh, the, the workshops are a bonus. But it's it, it, almost anything, you know, weather, short passages, other vicissitudes, uh, you know, sort of reduced the number of workshops. It's like the other day I was pulling on a royal boat, and the hill comes and takes it out of my hands, and I just blew. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm not making progress because I'm not doing it. And that's the only way you learn is well, it's the way I learn, hypistic learning, physically go through it. Mm -hmm. Here, no one really has a clue how to teach. So it's up to the individual. And for the most part, I think everyone is coping. Those of us who are frustrated is coping with that and kind of getting little bits and pieces here and there. We're teaching ourselves, basically. I am not really bad-mouthing the ship. I love the ship. I love sailing. And I think it's a wonderful experience. It's just that we are so frustrated that we're not more of the ship. And we want to be. We want to be as good as anybody else on the ship, and even better. Make fast! It's amazing how much more we know now than when we first showed up in Lunenburg. We've been taught countless knots, how to sew sails, how to lash cargo, how to use the radios and radars, how to deal with the small boats, how to bend sails, how to send sails down, how to furl, how the gadgets work, how the anchor works, how and when to use takels and lines and wires and elbow grease we didn't even know we had. We've even learned how to speak in the language of the sea. Phil, how do you say, like, come closer before I say come on? Make it fast. Uh, it's fast, it's fast, it's fast. Uh, it's fast, it's fast, it's fast. Say you like, lines like this, right? Yeah. And you want to come, just say walk at. Walk at, okay. Oh, walk at. And if you want to learn more than that, all you have to do is ask. Guys like the first and second mates are passionate about the ways of square rig sailing, and it's a joy for them to pass any information on. So, when I hear anyone on board saying they feel they're not getting enough training, my immediate thought is that A, they don't realize how much information they've allowed to seep in, and B, they aren't ambitiously taking responsibility for their own education. If you want to exceed here, you have to pursue it. Give it a little bit of throttle. Take driving the skiff, for example. It's an easy enough thing to learn, but I haven't bothered. In fact, less than half of us know how to drive it because it hasn't been officially taught. As a prosecuting attorney in Seattle, Jenny has learned that if you want information, you've got to force the issue, even if the process isn't always pleasant. I smell gas, Billy. Well, that's, that's common. Now, OK, hey, I don't want to hit the ship. Well, you're in charge. What are you going to do? I'm going to slow way down. I'm going to go around and do it again. I'm not shit. <laughs> it's frustrating, isn't it? Okay, now you're just gonna drag down the side, or? No, I'm gonna... Do what? Did I'm you trying to a... get my bow off. It's not working. Well, why? Shit, I almost had it. Well, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. Yeah. Midships? 
Midships. That's. That's not midships, because look away. Well, what am I going on here or here? Where's the thrust from the propeller going? It's right going there. off to the side, so yeah. it's obviously not a midships. And what's happened? You forced your bow forward. back okay. alongside. What you're doing is you just kind of like, it's just. <laughs> and there's no, but there's no sequence on what's happening and why, because you're not letting that happen. You're just, you're just falling into this trap of like do something, which isn't necessarily the right way to go. All right, all right, all right, I got so you. So wait a minute, wait, no you don't. I, I'm a slow learner and I got to no, do it no, on my own do way. No, no, do not make excuses, you're doing I, no, fine. No, I'm not, I'm saying this is but how I learn. You're not learning when you're yapping. Ahead? Yeah. Bingo. This is known as the perfect landing. There, is that hey, enough? Yeah, can I do it tomorrow too? Yeah. Thank you, Billy. I'm getting a feel for it. Guess what Sloan wants to get a feel for? The yeah. tattoo needle. Yeah, you know, his mom and dad thinks it's a wonderful idea. I can't believe it, but 12-year-old. Uh, uh... We'll hit him up. This guy looks the way every big city cool guy would like to look. But his tattoos aren't because of an urban fashion fad. George is a walking statement about the world he lives in. On his right side, the modern westernized world of French Polynesia, on the other is the tribal tradition that's left. This is the roots, our roots. And this is now. We had to leave both. We have, uh, we live now with telephone, machine, technology, but we still uh, keep our roots. Because the tattoo is, the, is everything. Your life, uh, if you want to be to have a wife, you have to be uh, have tattoo. Me. If if you want to go in a war, you Where have me. to have tattoo. Here, how long did this take? Uh, one year. Uh, that's, one year. Yeah, that's eleven years now. Yeah. Long time. I do it in Marquesas. I got it in the Marquesas. The Marquesas are an archipelago of Polynesian islands just to the north of here. The captain didn't invite George on board just so they could admire each other's ink. He also did it so George could meet some potential clients. See, George is a tattoo artist, and everyone on board is at least considering going under the needle. That's right. I said everyone. Well, yeah, it's too young. How old you got to be? 17. 17. 18. Because he's going to grow up. We never know. If the design like this, I do now, we never know if 18, 19 is going to be muscly or going to be big. Eh? He's 45 years old. No, we've been this. I talked to his mom a few months ago. It's okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you know, his mom and dad thinks it's a wonderful idea. I can't believe it, but uh, 12 year old. If Sloan is too young, why is he in the tattoo parlor? I wonder if George has changed his mind. If you like, you coming here, please. I explain to that. At this point in our journey, we haven't seen a single ship that looks even remotely like our three-masted bark. Today, though, that's all going to change. Six of us are about to take a leisurely tour of a 100-year-old vessel that is identical to the Picton Castle. You on the ship? Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, 180 feet long. Okay. And yours is 180. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is a Danish boat, and. Yes, no engine, huh? yeah. no engine on board, and with the wind, the ship touched the reef, and after, it sank in two days. In case you didn't figure it out, the three-masted bark we'll be touring is underwater. I learned to dive less than a year ago, and this is the first time I've ever been diving on a shipwreck. Seeing recognizable things like the wheel and a porthole and the anchor is a pretty good way to remind myself that no matter how tough it sometimes gets on board the Picton Castle, it could always get worse. I might be a beefcake, but not that much. <laughs> it will be worse when Phil and Maria go. Those two do an amazing amount of work. They don't pay to be here, but they don't get paid either. They're along for the ride as the captain's star pupils. For them, this is not so much an adventure vacation as it is the foundation of a career. But the captain has told them it all ends just two islands from now. See, they could use work. They don't have a mast. 
penniless, 8,000 miles from home, and has no idea how he would get back there. He's lived on the street before, but that's not really a lifestyle he wants to revisit. No one believes that the captain will just coldly turf him off the ship in a foreign land, but so far, he's said nothing to Phil about possible extensions or options, so Phil is preparing himself. Yeah, and like everyone's like, oh, you, you know, you're gonna stay, you're gonna stay, and it's like, oh, I'm not gonna, I'm just like, yeah, but I can't, like, I can't, like, you know, no matter, like, how, like, you know, if someone overheard the captain say it or something like that, it's like, I can't, I can't, like, let myself believe it. Like, I have to keep thinking that's what, like, that I am gonna leave. And then, like, you know, until I hear it from his mouth that I'm, that I'm staying, then I, I don't believe it, you know? Maria lives in Prince Edward Island, but she was actually born while sailing. As place of birth on her passport, it doesn't list a country, it just gives a longitude and a latitude mark somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. If she's stressed about where her life of sailing might lead next, she sure doesn't show it. The adventurous side of me is almost wanting to see what else we can do. I mean, if I saw something in Rarotonga and saw a ship that was really great or another sailboat that was going to take me all the other places and stuff, I think I'd probably go. I mean, why not? But if you ask me, I think I'm going to stay. <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> This trip is not the first time Phil has volunteered his sailing services on board the Picton Castle. His relationship with the captain started two years ago when Phil charmed his way into a chat with the man. I wasn't really that scared of him, but like, <laughs> I mean, I'm not scared of him, but I didn't really, like I had no knowledge of, you know, like what he was like. So I just went up to him right up and I was just like, hey, what's up? You know, and I had like a mohawk and combat boots and stuff and I was just like, What's up, you know, like, how's it going? And he was just kind of like, yeah. Kind of looked me up and down and was like, mm-hmm, you know. And it's weird, like, it's weird how much, like, I've changed, like, my lifestyle to, like, accommodate, you know, getting on the ship. But, you know, it's worth it, definitely. I don't know. But, yeah, I, I, my first impressions of the captain were, I don't know, he seemed pretty hardcore. But at the same time, he had a lot, you know, I could... But that's what you wanted? Yeah, you know, I was in for that. None of us are in for picking up a case of dengue fever, but if we pick up Mac in Bora Bora like we're supposed to tomorrow, we'll be right in the heart of an epidemic. Or will we be? Our dengue reconnaissance team heads to a hospital to find out. Effectively, there is an epidemic right now. There is. C'est le type 1 qui a sévi une douzaine d'années. And it's, it's not only in Bora Bora, it could be, it's all Polynesia. Okay. Yeah, all Polynesia? Oops. Okay. For the last month, we thought that we were sailing towards a dengue fever epidemic. Turns out, we've been in it the whole time. So we have just as much exposure here right now as if we went to Bora Bora. Wait, exactly. Yeah, there is already some cases, a few cases here, and in Tahiti. Okay. So it's Bora Bora, Tahiti, probably Morea. Morea? Il y en avait à Bora. Bora Bora. So 19 cases in Bora Bora. 19 cases in a population of 6,000. Huh, sounds a little dodgy. Yeah, but so does sailing around the world. We load up on mosquito repellent and make waves. credited with being a mosquito-y type area, so good to avoid, but... Small boat handling is something we're supposed to learn during this big ship trip. And with that in mind, 10 of us have planned an excursion in the Monomoy to outer Bora Bora. This is the place you can sleep. You might be able to sleep anywhere, but I would definitely sleep on the windward side of the island, and not on uh, the lee. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Avoid our dinghy stuff. Okay, okay, give me the stern line. We're getting out of here. We're blowing. Let's blow this pop stand wide open, baby. Cool. This is the first time I've been in the Monomoy under the power of its sail. You know what I'm looking forward to on this trip? Cooking for myself. 
Not that the food on board is bad, it just is what it has to be. Cheap meat, canned carrots, endless carbohydrates. But don't get me wrong, nobody's getting scurvy and nobody's starving to death. It's just that when you're used to living near grocery stores and visiting buffet tables, living without refrigeration can make you grumble, especially if you're the cook. I'm usually pretty miserable if I only have canned, canned food to deal with. And, but, and it just, I don't know, I feel really unhealthy. And uh, I've never, I never realized, like I tell you, I've cooked all my life and I've been buying food with my allowance when I was five and six years old. But I never realized how diet driven I am until this trip. And when we run out of food and there's only canned vegetables and you're living on pasta and bread for a week, it, uh, it affects everything. My psyche, my physical being, everything. I don't feel healthy and mentally my morale is way down. And being the cook, you hear it from everyone. You get tired of hearing it. So during meals, you just go eat by yourself so that you don't have to listen to it. As the Monomoy clips along, we do what we always do while underway, gossip. At this stage in our relationships, though, the dish is becoming more personal, like this tidbit about one of Jenny's broken engagements. So it was a couple of months before the wedding, and he just... Well, see, what happened is my, my brother-in-law at that time was in the Marine Corps. Okay. This guy totally kind of, like, falls off the face of the earth, and so that they looked him up because he had that military access. Right. And the message came back, who the hell are you and why do you want to know about this guy? So... Wow. And wow. I, yeah. Do so you think maybe he was in trouble or something? Or you think no, I don't think he was. Had to I take think off. Took off. How is it? Is it gonna, is it gonna last? <laughs> is it gonna last? Well, you were talking about sailors, you know. I don't know. <laughs> is it, uh, see, I, I always tend to fall for the guys that never stay in one spot. Long distance romance. Well, no, it's like, I don't even... I don't think long distance works. Like I just don't buy into it, and so I end up. It ends up kind of going. Yeah. And then yeah. I always wonder, 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 wonder. I always tend to be the, the one that's not staying in one place. Jim isn't staying in one place, and his relationship is still solid. Okay. I'm just going to send a quick message to my wife. I hope she gets it before she leaves because she's coming to Rarotonga in about five days. So. Jim is a rock. It's hard to tell what sort of emotional state he's in, but it must be complex. In 37 years of marriage, he's never been away from his wife for longer than a week. And that's not even the complex part. Uh, about a year ago, my wife uh, got quite sick. She, uh, she had a cerebral aneurysm and, uh, and nearly died. And uh, uh, miraculously, she, she didn't. And um, she was in the hospital for 100 days. And, uh, and then after that, a lot of outpatient therapy and so on, and um, she made a really, really good recovery, And um, but she, she can't really be independent. So while Jim is here, living his dream, his wife is staying with family members. This voyage is no mere whim for the Picton Castle's oldest trainee. For 30 years, Jim has been planning to sail around the world. Now, look, I gotta be honest. When I first heard about Jim's wife's health problems, I thought he'd made a vulgar and selfish mistake by coming on this trip. <laughs> All the way from way good. Ah, look, at that. look at that. Mm. Is that edible, that but look at me. I'm 30 years old, going on 18. What the hell do I know? I have never pulled off two straight years of monogamy, let alone 37. What's really vulgar and selfish is me forming my opinion without even having the faintest understanding of the type of bond that holds Jim and his family and his marriage together. All right, what we're going to do, study for the moment. The fact of the matter is that Jim taking this trip was his wife's idea. We had a family meeting, including her mother, and they all, they all backed it, which was amazing to me, you know, they were, they were right, they were all behind her, all of them. My wife and my children and my mother-in-law. And, uh, uh, and she will stay with all of them at one time or another. And so I think it'll work out. I hope nothing happens that'll, you know, cause me to cut the trip short. And, uh, that's certainly a possibility. Um, but uh, with any luck at all, I can, I'll be able to go the distance.
Well, we made it to our private campground last night. We set up our tents and hammocks and we cooked some lamb in the fire, but we had nothing to drink, so we actually turned in early. Except for Moises and Krista. They stayed up all hours of the night so they could make goo-goo eyes at one another and lament the fact that in two weeks, Krista will head home. <laughs> Stinking hot in the tent last night. Unzip it, stick the head out into there. <laughs> all statuesque, holding each other about three feet from the door of the tent. I'm like, oh, and I went back in. It's like, oh, I gotta flap this thing out. It's too hot in here. Five minutes later, I unzip and say, they haven't moved. They're still stoic and it's holding on to each other. It is scary. Well. But they're leaving each other forever in just a few days, so. <laughs> <laughs> they have to say goodbye. It's love. They're weird, I don't think man. so. <laughs> I think it's 4 a.m. wood, to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, they're they're it's an image I almost forgot. <laughs> We return triumphantly to the ship with high hopes of finding some calamine lotion. Okay, sheet it in hard. We all foolishly allowed ourselves to get bitten last night. And when we find out that Mac is back, those bug bites get itchier. Not because he makes our skin crawl, because he got dengue fever. You got it the first day he was here. You're all achy and your eyes will hurt and you have a wicked headache and it feels like you're gonna die. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah. Got shot by some bugs. <laughs> yeah? Like black flies more than mosquitoes? I was asleep, I don't know what they are. <laughs> but at least you get to sleep through them then. That's not more Well, mosquitoes. see, we had the tent, right? There were no poles to go in it, so we just kind of tied it to the palm trees and stuff. But then it got really hot, so I opened it up and the bugs all came in there. But <laughs> if I have dengue fever, it's all your fault. Anything happens to you, it's all my fault. <laughs> this is just the way it goes. Because of the snowballing dengue threat, the captain has canceled all the other camping yeah, right. trips. Personally, I think paranoia is blowing this whole thing out of proportion. Lauren, on the other hand, is pissed off. I think that it just could have been avoided. You know, like, we could have been called on the radio. They, we didn't have to spend the night there. You know, they had the information. They knew it wasn't a good idea. No one else was doing it. And, yeah, we all got child, so... I'm not very happy about it. But we had one of the best nights we had. Yeah, we did, but, I mean, I'd like to have known... I mean, he said if he knew now what he knew that... You know, if he knew then what he knows now, we wouldn't have come here in the first place. Yeah, but we knew there was dengue on board for when we got here. Yeah, but that we little thing that they night, told us too. just before we got here, that it's not that bad, and now it's, you know, it's a totally different story, so... That, yeah, um, well, that was the information available at the time, I think. Yeah, but last night they knew about Yeah, the information when we left the Mac was on the wire, with, on the horn. Oh, and, and we were in there. radio contact the entire time, so, I mean, I don't really? know. Really? Well, as they say, what's done is done. I had a bit of a hangover when I woke up and I thought I'd done some internal damage with drinking. <laughs> My kidneys were in pain. Afraid you pushed the old fun meter just a wee little bit too hard. Then I went overboard. But it, uh, the hangover went away and the fever set in. Yeah, nothing quite, quite so pleasurable being sick on the other side of the planet all by yourself with a language and culture you know nothing about, you can't speak the language. That's really a real... It's a treat. A real treat, yeah. Mac is back to his version of normal, but the rest of us are in for a week of anguish. That's the incubation period for dengue fever. Hey, Mom, how you doing? Hi, Gary. My mother is a rookie Sorry. university professor who is simultaneously oh, pursuing her PhD. For scheduling reasons, she's just postponed to plan to visit me. So you think where are you going to show up or you don't really even know? We don't know yet, Andrew. <clears throat> I, I would love to go to the Seychelles. Oh, yeah? That, that would be my choice, but I, other than Bali. But I, but I don't see how I could pick Bali. Why couldn't you pick Bali? Oh, because of timing. Because I'm right in the middle of teaching. Yeah, right. Well, the Seychelles would be okay. As long as it's a mail port, we generally make up 
the, the time that we've lost at mail ports. We're getting pretty close to on schedule and we arrive in places on mail ports. Okay. 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 Anyways, I'm down to zero units on a uh, 60 unit card, so I love you guys. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, All right? Good enough. Bye bye. Take care. I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me if she didn't come during the summer either, just because she was up to her eyes and work. It wouldn't surprise me if she didn't come in Christmas because she was up to her eyes and work. And it wouldn't surprise me if she never came. Sailing away from French Polynesia, we're all thinking the same thing. When we hit Rarotonga, will we really lose Maria and Phil? With every officer in attendance on the quarterdeck, Maria is summoned. So do you want a job in the summer of uh, 2002 on a bark? Whoa, <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right, might have one for you. Oh, man. You, uh, Speculate you'll get your seaman's papers and pursue all that stuff in a I most in, in a dispatched manner. Yes, most definitely. <laughs> all right. Well, do you want to stay on the rest of this world voyage? Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I don't think so. <laughs> black flies. <are> black flies. <laughs> hey, I or think do you want to get a waitressing me. job or selling knickknacks at uh, Anna Van Gable's shop there? <laughs> or what is it you got to do there? Hey, we ditch in the island. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, you, you better stick with this kid. Oh. For the rest of the trip. What's going on? What's going on? Why is he failing? I'm here for the rest of the voyage. Oh, <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> no shit! No shit! Guys. I'm here for the rest of the voyage. Oh my god, that's awesome! Congratulations! That is awesome. But just imagine you were Phil. He does the same work as Maria, and he's been left in the dark. Happy birthday. I don't know. What do you... <laughs> were you surprised? I mean, it's excited for her, sure. But, I she works hard, right, so doesn't like lessen my chances or improve them, so. So, I don't know, I'm happy for it. What can I say? Yeah. As we approach the port where this ship is actually registered, Rarotonga in the Cook Islands, the captain lets us in on a small piece of his personal history. When he was in Raro as a young man, he won a Polynesian dance contest. And he wants it known, in no dance. uncertain terms, like that if any Picton Castle crew the member should find themselves in a similar competition, dancing, we had better win. Do. So now it becomes really a question of how embarrassing is your dancing going to be? <laughs> guys, should, come on, guys, we got to practice this. Come on, line up with me. More guys, come on, we're going to practice. You're up on the balls of their feet. Okay, just keep them bent and move, like, get on your toes like that. If you can, it makes it easier. One side. This makes doing the bird dance at a wedding seem dignified. Ah, well, we do have a lot to celebrate. We survived dengue fever, the captain is in an unusually good mood, and we're in for five more months of South Pacific Island hopping. Given that state of affairs, who wouldn't shake their booty? Come on. Hey, check this out. Sloan got the tattoo. He must be on top of the world. For me, though, something's wrong. Superficially, I put up a good front, but you know, paradise just ain't working for me. I, I don't know, I can't explain it properly. But rest assured, I will get to the bottom of it. Next time on Tall Ship Chronicles, Jim gets a visit from his wife. Oh, you look so good. 
the captain takes Phil job hunting. If I were you, this is what I'd want to do. It'd be a hell of a lot of fun. And I introduce Lauren to my parents. I can drive! That's next time on Tall Ship Chronicles.